Hello AP STAT students and welcome to another exciting day of distance learning. Today we're going to do lesson 2.2 and topic normal random variables. Uh, now last lesson you learned about the empirical rule and you learned about um, the normal distribution. A question should have arisen when you were doing the problems and, and learning that lesson saying hey hold on what what if what if something isn't exactly one standard deviation or two standard deviations or some, you know, uh, integer number of standard deviations away from the mean? Does that mean we can't do the problem? Um, and of course, the answer to that is no. And that is what we're going to go over today. So we're talking about normal random variables and we will see how to deal with any number of standard deviations away from the mean. Okay, so here's how we do it. Um, the empirical rule is basically telling us that all normal distributions um, have things in common. Um, and if we start talking about how many standard deviations from the mean we are, um, then they are all going to have the same percentages, the same distribution, okay? So as long as we measure these things in terms of how many standard deviations we are from the mean, it's all going to work out. And once we start doing that, well, if I say I am zero standard deviations from the mean or I am one standard deviation from the mean, so on and so forth, it brings us to the idea of the standard normal distribution. Um, and the number of standard deviations from the mean um, is often referred to as a z-score. So it's pretty simple. Take your piece of data, subtract the mean of your distribution, right? That gets you the distance away from the mean. And then if you divide by the size of the standard deviation, that'll tell you how many standard deviations away from the mean uh, that you are. So again, we're going to call that a z-score or just z. Okay, so once I do that, I've created the standard normal distribution. It is a normal distribution. It has a mean of zero, right? Because if I landed right on the mean, I would say... Oh, I am zero uh, standard deviations from, from the mean. So anyway, the mean would be zero and the standard deviation for this distribution is one because it's how many standard deviations away from the mean am I? So it's going to have the same shape, uh, but the center will be at zero. Uh, any positive value means I'm above the mean. Any negative value means I'm below the mean. Okay, now that special normal distribution that we call the standard normal distribution. Um, it's of course defined by a function and here's the function it's defined by. Um, you'll never need to see it again. As you can see, it's kind of a complicated function. It's not super pleasant uh, to work with, although it does contain my two favorite irrational numbers, both pi and e are in there. Okay. Um, and of course, the easy way, instead of writing this out, the easy way to say, hey, standard normal is to do this. Capital N for normal means zero, standard deviation one. So that's the easy way to talk about this function. Okay, now things to notice about the standard normal distribution. The function is always on or above the x-axis. Um, and this is calculus notation. If you don't know it, that's fine. This just says the total area under the standard normal curve is equal to exactly one. So this just says if I start at negative infinity and I go all the way to positive infinity and I keep track of all the area there, um, it equals the area would equal exactly one. So those two um, observations should tell you something about the standard normal distribution. It's a density curve. Remember, those are the two criteria to have a density curve. So it's a very common density curve. Now, um, since the mean of the distribution is zero, and since the normal any normal curve uh, has the mean at, its, at, at it, the exact center of the curve, and it's perfectly symmetrical, then this particular normal curve is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So there it is in words. These symbols are saying those words. So if you're not familiar with calculus, don't worry. Just learn the words. If you are familiar with calculus, then uh, this is saying if I find the area from negative infinity up to zero of my function, um, the area there is 
one half or 0.5. Um, and same thing if I take the area from zero to infinity of my function, um, I get 0.5. So half of the area is on either side of the y-axis. Okay, now, again, this is calculus. We're saying, um, here's my function, right? My standard normal curve. What if I wanna find the area from negative infinity to some value b? In calculus, what we would do is we would integrate the curve. That's what these symbols are saying. We would integrate the curve uh, to find that area. The problem is, those of you that have had calculus, this is not a fun function to try to integrate. So here's the good news. It's been done for you. And that's why you can take this class without knowing any calculus. So don't worry again about the symbols. This is just telling you what we will be doing, but you don't actually have to, to, to do it. Okay, more calculus symbols. You don't have to, again, know what this is telling you. But it's, it's basically showing us that we're allowed to do these problems uh, in more than one way. We can find areas by using symmetry. Uh, we could also find areas by using what we call the complement. Since I know the total area is one, right? If I know the area I'm not interested in, if I subtract that from one, I would now have the area that I am interested in. So that's all we're saying here. And again, don't worry if you can't read this or if, it, if you can read it and it doesn't make sense, you'll, you'll see when we do some problems. Um, but this is just the background why we can do problems the way that we're gonna do them. Okay, let me cover this up real quick. Um, so this is what we will be doing. Um, instead of integrating the function yourself, it turns out the work's been done for you. So if you get your formula sheet and take a look at table A, uh, you will find values of our um, standard normal curve, and they're labeled as, as Z values. So let me grab my table. And table A can be found in the formula packet that you'll be given when you take the AP exam, right? And I put this on our um, Canvas page. So if we turn the page after the formulas, our first table, table A. And the table has a nice diagram, right? This picture's worth a thousand words, supposedly. And it does tell you a lot, right? It shows a Z, and then it shows an area left of the Z being shaded in, and then in words, right? So it's giving you a probability or a percentile, those are kind of synonyms, um, for landing at Z or below. Okay, so if, if I have a Z of 0.1, that means that I am 0.1 standard deviations above the mean. So that means I have a little over, I'm, I'm a little over the 50th percentile, right? Well, this table will tell me exactly where that would be. Rather than saying, well, I know it's more than 50%, I can actually get um, quite accurate with the table. So what I do is I look at this first column labeled Z, and I go until I find 0.1. You'll notice the first page is all negatives, meaning below the mean, whoops. Okay, the back of the page, still all negatives. Then we get to uh, zero and you'll see, hey, look, right, 50% because it, um, a z-score of zero means you're at the mean. Turn the page, there's zero again, 50%. And now here we are, 0.1. So if I am 0.1 standard deviations above the mean, I would be capturing 0 0.5398 um, of the data, okay? So in other words, 53.98% of the data, right? This is the, the probability or the proportion. Just move it over two decimals for the percentage. And there you go, okay? Now, what if I am 1.3 standard deviations above the mean? So then I go further down my table, I find 1.3, and there you go. I'd have a little over 90% of the data to the left. Okay. Now, you'll notice there's all these other columns across the top. Okay. The first column, right, this is for a hundredths digit of zero. Okay. 
as I move across, this, this column would give me a hundredth digit of one, hundredth digit of two, hundredth digit of three, so on and so forth. So if I get a value like 1.33, meaning I'm 1.33 standard deviations above the mean, I go here, right? There's the Z of 1.3. And then I go to this column where the hundredths digit is a three as well. And so now this value is representing 1.33 standard deviations above the mean. Um, and not surprising, it's, it's not that more than the 1.30, uh, but it is, of course, a little bit more. Okay, so that's how we use our table. And our table will give us accuracy up to 1 100th of a standard deviation. So pretty darn accurate and pretty darn quick and helpful. Okay, these are basically all coming from that function that I showed earlier with the pi and the e, okay, and some calculus. Okay, so now let's use this information to actually do some problems. So um, we're going to go back to our IQ test because it's normally distributed. There's the mean, there's the standard deviation. Now, let's say we want to know what percentage of the population uh, gets an IQ of 90 or lower. Well, we would say, okay, how many standard deviations is that, right? So I would say, oh, by the way, here's how I could convert these words into a problem just using symbols. So the probability that my X value is less than 90, right? I just converted the words into symbols. So what I need to know is, well, how many standard deviations uh, from the mean is 90? In other words, a z-score. So I would get my z. 90 is my data value, my the point I'm interested in. 110 is the mean of the distribution, so that tells me I'm 20 units below the mean. Um, but my standard deviation is actually 25, so I'm not a full standard deviation below, right? I'm a fractional standard deviation below. So if we work this out, we'll get um, negative 0.8. So I'm 0.8 standard deviations below the mean. Okay. Um, now we could show that work again using the, the notation. I, I would say, what's the probability that my z is less than negative 0.8 standard deviations? Okay, and then out my table okay find the page with the negative values okay oh that page doesn't quite get there so turning it over there it is negative 0 0.8 standard deviations uh, below the mean means that you are roughly the 21st percentile so in other words a score of 90 on the IQ test would put you in roughly the 21st percentile so there you go. Oh, sometimes students ask, well, should I put 0.2119 or should I put 21.19%? Um, and my answer would be, read the problem. It says what percentage, so please answer in a percentage. And there you go. That's your first use of the standard normal distribution to answer um, a normal distribution question. Let's try another one. Oh, and of course, that was a left tail problem. Remember last time we talked about left tail, right tail, center section? So that one was our left tail problem. Let's try a right tail problem. So what percentage of the population has an IQ above 120, right? Above, meaning right tailed. So probability X is greater than 120. Okay, let's get our Z score. 20 is our interest, our, our value of, that we're interested in. 110 is our mean. So you can see we're 10 units above the mean. Um, but with a standard deviation of 25, that's less than one standard deviation, right? So let's see, 10 over 25. That would be 0 0.4. So we want to find what's the probability that I get a Z-score 
or in other words, a number of standard deviations of 0.4 or more. Okay, so this is where that whole calculus thing on that page was all about. There's two ways to, to do this problem, okay? The first way would be using the complement. You see my table, my table gives me left tails, area to the left. So what I could do is I could find the area to the left that I don't want and subtract it from one. That's called using the complement. Okay, so let's do it that way first. So I'm gonna find, I'm basically gonna do one minus the probability that I get less than 0.4, okay? So there is the 0.4. So if I do one minus that, I'll have my answer. One minus 0.6554. Okay, now graphically, I'll just draw, I'll just draw right here. No, there, oh, there's the answer, right? So when I do it, so, if you think about it graphically, right? What I did was I'm over here, there's the 0 0.4, right? I'm interested in the area to the right. So my table gave me this to the left, okay? This area is 65.54%. So if I subtract that from one, I have the shaded area, the area that I'm interested in, okay? That's called using the complement, knowing the sum is one and subtracting the part you don't want from, from one. Now, I could also use symmetry, okay? By symmetry, draw another little drawing here. If that's 0 0.4 and I want the area to the right, I know my curve is perfectly symmetrical. So I could do negative 0 0.4 and I know that this area right here will be equal to the area on the right, right? Area to the left of negative 0.4 will be equal to the area to the right of positive 0.4. So that's my other way to do this. Um, I kind of think that's faster, right? Because I can just go straight to negative 0.4 and there's the answer without having to subtract anything from one. Um, but it's correct to do it either way. And if you have the time, maybe do it you know, both ways just to, to check yourself. So there you go. That's how we do a right tail question with a standard normal table that only gives me left tail values. There are other tables, by the way. Some tables only give right tail values. So if you really wanted, I guess you could carry an extra table around with you. Uh, but on the AP exam, this is the table that they will provide. So make sure you know how to use a left tail table. All right, so that was a right tail. Okay, moving on. Let's try a center section problem. And you can see why this is a center section problem because they give me a lower bound and an upper bound. We're saying between these two scores. So this says, what's the probability that my, my X or my, my data value is between these two? Okay, so again, first thing I need to do is convert to Z scores or in, or in other words, how many standard deviations from the mean are these two values, which is pretty easy. And of course, we already did that one, negative 0 0.8. Okay, do the other one. And, well, that's very close to the mean, but just slightly below it, right? negative uh, 0 0.04. So I want to find the probability I am between those two z-scores. Okay, so that's writing it in terms of the variable, writing it in terms of z-scores, or in other words, number of standard deviations. Okay, so we again have an issue if I'm using table A, it's a left tail table. So drawing it. Here's 
my upper bound and there's my lower bound and I want this area in between. But again, my table only gives areas to the left, left tails. So what we need to do is find the, the area below negative 0 0.04. And that'll be too much. It'll give me everything to the left. Um, but I can then use the table to find the area below negative 0 0.8 which I don't want to include. And if I subtract that area away from the larger area, I'll be left with the area in between. Okay, so I'm gonna do the area to the left of negative 0 0.04, and I'm gonna subtract away the area to the left of negative 0 0.8, right? This will give me the area in between. So using my table, okay, so there's the area to the left of negative 0 0.04, okay, and the area to the left of negative 0.8 is right there. get our answer. So that's how you use a left tail table to do a center section problem. And you would use a right tail table the same way, except you would reverse the subtraction, right? You're always, of course, taking the, the larger area minus the smaller area. And that's that's kind of an important thing to, to realize. These these answers, right, they're, they're percentages are um, always between zero and one inclusive, right? You can never have a negative um, percentile. Okay. All right, there's one more type of problem. It's what we call the inverse problem. When you come across this problem, it should really stand out because notice they're giving you the percentile, right? They're giving you what was the answer to the previous questions, and they want you to go work backwards and find the score associated with that percentile. So that's exactly what we end up doing. We end up working backwards. So we gotta find the z-score that would correspond to the 90th percentile. Or in other words, how many standard deviations above the mean do I need to land to be in the 90th percentile? So I read my table backwards, right? I read my table in reverse. So at the mean would be 50th percentile, right? One standard deviation above is roughly the 84th percentile. Well, two standard deviations above is the 97 point whatever percentile. That's too high. So somewhere between one and two. And those are the kinds of things you should be kind of working out without even looking at the table. Like that's your check. You know, that's why we taught you the empirical rule. That's how you can check that your answer is reasonable. <laughs> so um, let's read through here and see if I can find 90th percentile. Okay. It's not listed exactly, right? This is just below the 90th percentile, and this one's just above the 90th percentile. How do I know which one to choose? Well, it's the wording of the question. If the question is asking, well, approximately what would you need, then look at these two and go with the closer one. So I would go with that one. If the question is you must make it into the 90th percentile, realize that guy doesn't make it. This is the first choice that does make it, so then I would choose that one. So. Based on the wording of the question, um, it should hopefully guide you so you know which of the two to choose, either the closer one or if it's more of an inequality type question um, with like a greater than, then I know I have to be greater than the 90, greater than or equal to the 90th percentile, so I would, I would then go with this one. So based on the wording here, it says I wanna be in the 90th percentile, so I'm gonna go with that, right? Because this value doesn't quite put me in the 90th, that does. So, um, 1.29 standard deviations above the mean will, will put me into the 90th percentile. So my Z has to be 1.29 standard deviations above the mean to achieve the 90th percentile. Now, I use my, my formula and I have three of the four values, right? There's the Z. 
This time the x is unknown because I'm working backwards to get it. But the distribution mean and standard deviation are, of course, given. So if I solve this equation, I will know what score is required. So 1.29 standard deviations on this distribution means I need to score 32.25 points above average, right? And the average is 110, so I need to score 142.25 on this test. Um, and I went ahead and put the inequality back in there, right? Realize that this is an inequality. I have to score that or greater. Um, I can't score 142.25 on an IQ test, so um, rounding following the inequality puts me at 143. So I need to score at least 143 to make it in the 90th percentile. Okay, now that's doing the problems using the table. And sometimes you might have to use the table. There will be some questions that they specify. Use the table to do the problems or read your table and give me some value off the table. So make sure you know how to use it. But I'm going to go back now and redo those problems using the calculator because it's faster and it's more accurate. So um, our left tail problem. This is the standard normal or using a normal distribution problem. So distribution is the key word there. Right above variables or VARs, VAR stands for variables, is this distribution menu. Okay, so that's where we go when I'm working with a known distribution. So I go second, VARs or variables, and the first two choices deal with the normal distribution. In this case, I'm going to choose the second choice, normal CDF. That stands for a normal cumulative density function. Remember, we said this is a density curve, so choose that. Um, now, the some calculators will actually prompt you, lower bound, upper bound, mean, standard deviation. Some don't. Okay, mine doesn't. So the way it works is I put in my lower bound, then my upper bound, then the distribution mean and the distribution standard deviation. Since this is a left tail problem, right, left tail, there really is no lower bound. It's from some value and then to negative infinity. So go ahead and put negative infinity in there. I always like to make students look for the infinity key on their calculators. Good luck finding it. It doesn't exist. Um, so the way we signify negative infinity to our calculator, by the way, make sure to put the negative key right? That's this guy. Don't press subtraction. It'll say error. It doesn't read that as a negative. Some calculators do. This one doesn't. So there's your negative key. And then to get negative infinity, just put a bunch of nines, right? So we're saying if I scored that, um, that's really kind of like negative infinity. Okay, then you need to put your upper bound. So on a left tail problem, the upper bound is the given value. So 90, and then the distribution's mean, and then the distribution's standard deviation. And then calculator works it out, and there we go. Okay. Our table gives us four decimal places of accuracy. Our calculator gives us many more decimal places of accuracy. So it's faster, and it's more accurate. Um, now that brings us to an important point. If... This is a free response test question. Which answer should you report? Either one is acceptable. So you can just say from table A, there's my answer. Or you can say using the calculator, there's my answer. Okay, but very important, if it's a free response question and all you write is what you see on your calculator screen, you will get zero points. That's not me being mean. That's the way the AP test is graded. Writing in calculator commands, writing that down on a piece of paper is not considered acceptable work. You will get no credit for that. You need to do what I did over here and calculate the z-score and then write this answer down. Okay, So this work is required no matter if you use table A or the calculator. And then you can report either answer. 
Okay, let's do a right tail problem on the calculator. So we again would do a normal CDF. This time the lower bound is uh, 120, right? We're going 120 or above. Upper bound is positive infinity. Just put a bunch of nines. Distribution mean, distribution standard deviation. And there you go. And we can see it's the same answer as table A, just with more decimal accuracy. Okay, now doing my center section problem, here's where my calculator really shines because it's really designed for a center section problem. Because they've given me the lower bound, they've given me an upper bound, and they gave me the mean and standard deviation of the distribution, and there's my answer to the center section problem. You will notice we are actually slightly different, right? If this were rounded to four decimal places, it would be 0.2722, and using table A, we got uh, 0.2721, because table A is rounding to four decimal places, and then that rounded value is used in more than one spot, it ends up giving me an answer that is slightly different than my calculator answer. But again, it's okay on a free response. You could report either number. However, on a multiple choice question, you now have a dilemma, right? Let's say um, you use table A. This is the answer you wrote down on your paper. But the answer I have on my calculator screen is listed as an answer choice. I won't list both, right? Because they're kind of both right. I'll never list both. One of the two will be listed. Now, if you have the 27.21% and I have 27.22% listed as an answer, please don't choose none of the above. Okay, realize I used the calculator and you used table A and that's the correct answer. Or vice versa, right? If I have the table A answer listed, you use the calculator, please realize it's the same answer. Do not put none of the above. I can't list both, okay? So this happens sometimes. And every year on the test, there's students that choose none of the above because their answer is 0. .0001 different than the answer that I've put as the correct answer. And it's just because they use the other method of the two, okay? So use your brain a little bit, use a little common sense and realize they're the same. And if you can't use common sense to do that, well then do every problem twice. Do it on the calculator and do it with table A and find that one of, uh, of those two answers um, in the multiple choice, okay? So don't fall for that mistake, please. All right, um, this problem type, the inverse problem type can also be done on the calculator, so let's do that. So again, we go to the distribution menu and you'll see uh, choice three is the inverse normal. So I choose that. To use it, I enter the uh, percentile first and I have to enter that as a decimal. So the 90th percentile is 0.9. And then the mean and the standard deviation. So it only needs three pieces of information. Okay, and there you go. And again, this is uh, definitely more accurate than the table, because remember, we couldn't even find the exact 90th percentile in the table. Uh, the calculator can get to um, a pretty exact 90th percentile exact meaning more decimal accuracy okay uh, but again both answers are, are acceptable and both in this case would round to the 143 every once in a while um, right you could see this guy was almost 142 and that guy was 143 that could happen again common sense right all right so that's kind of the main part of the lesson but there's one more thing we have to cover um, I showed you the calculator already. The other thing I need to cover um, is, you know, students learn this normal calculation and they fall in love with it and they want to use it on every problem for the rest of the year. Um, but you can only use this when the distribution is normal, right? It's a normal calculation. It can be only used on normal distribution. So um, it kind of is important to understand when do I have a normal distribution? Right, how do I assess normality? Um, and there's, there's a couple steps. Uh, first thing you can do, 
graph it, right? And the, and the graphs that are nice uh, for showing the normal shape are either a histogram or a stem plot, right? They should show low on the tails and high in the center, okay? After um, looking at a graph, well, use your empirical rule. What percent of the data is, uh, land within one standard deviation? Is it approximately 68%? Right, and when I say approximately, that means 72%, 60%, right? Okay, that's fine. How about within two standard deviations? Are you somewhere in the ballpark of 95%? Okay. Um, if within one standard deviation, you only capture 20% of the data, you're gonna go, huh, there's a problem here, right? Notice I don't go to three standard deviations, 99.7%. Um, you'd have to have a very large sample size uh, for that to be of any value. Okay. Now, the last method is really um, the best method. I personally just go straight to this method. It's the most accurate of the methods, um, and that's make a normal probability plot. So another new type of graph. I'm going to show you how to make one of these by hand. Um, once and only once after that, we will just use our calculator to do it because it's tedious to do it by hand. And it's perfectly acceptable to use technology to help us on that. Okay, um, so our normal probability plot. Here, I made a very short list of data. Um, and the question is, does it, uh, does it follow a normal distribution or not? So the way I make my normal probability plot, um, first I look at how, actually back up. First, I put my data in ascending order. Okay, must be in ascending order. Then I look at my sample size, in this case, six pieces of data. Okay, all right. Now, I calculate what I call proportional midpoints. Um, that's not really a formal name. I just felt like it needed a name, so I came up with one. To do that, the numerator um, would be odd integers. So actually, uh, odd whole numbers, one, three, five, seven, nine, et cetera. And the denominators will be two times your sample size. Okay, so basically what I'm doing is I'm creating fractional values that are between zero and one, and they're evenly spaced. Okay. All right, now for the inverse part, right? It's a normal probability plot. Um, it uses an inverse step. So I turn these um, fractions into decimals. And now I'm going to find these decimals, pretend they're percentiles for table A. So finding these in the body of table A, and then report the corresponding z-score or report the corresponding number of standard deviations you have to be to hit these percentiles. Okay, so you can see the first is 0 0.083 repeating. That's a small value, so I know I'm gonna be in the negatives. Okay, 0 0.083 repeating. Not quite there. And here I am. I'm somewhere over here. And these don't need to be interpreted as greater than or, or less than or any type of inequality. Just go with whichever one's closer. Um, you're making a graph. And to be honest with you, on your graph, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between negative 1.38, negative 1.39, negative 1.4, right? I mean, you're graphing this by hand, you're not going to see the difference. So um, anyway, it looks like that would be my, my closest choice, though. So I'm going to say negative 1.38. There it is. Okay. And then I continue. So I'm going to find 25th percentile. And over here, so negative 0 0.67 standard deviations will put me around the 25th percentile. And then I find the next one, 0.416. OK, 
Okay, that's right here. Uh, negative 0.21 standard deviations below the mean. Um, now here's the good news. I already know the answer when I look up 0.583. It's going to be positive 0.21 because my these are evenly spaced, right? And my distribution is perfectly symmetric. So um, once I go past 50th percentile, these will just simply be the opposite uh, sign of the first half of the table. Okay, so there, there we go. Now I make my plot. Okay, so I'll put that up top. Okay, I'm going to be plotting six points. There's the x coordinate and there's the y coordinate of the first point, so on and so forth. Okay, so the first point is 1, negative 1.38. Uh, second point is 2, negative 0.67. Third point is 3, negative 0.21. And then I have a 3, positive 0.21. Okay, these things don't have to be functions, right? Some of you might be going, hey, wait, there fails the vertical line test. Correct. These don't have to be functions, and that's not important in the least if it's a function or not, this, this particular graph. That's not what we're looking for. So just keep graphing. 4.67 and 5, 1.38. There you go. We just made a normal probability plot by hand. The last time you'll do one of those. Yay. Let me show you how to do it on the calculator. Okay, so enter your data. Just clear that. So there's my data. Uh, by the way, the calculator doesn't require the data to be listed in ascending order. You can just list the data in any order. The calculator will be fine with it. Okay, go to stat plot. First choice is a scatter plot. Second choice, time plot. Third choice, histogram, modified box, regular box. And there you go. The last choice, that is the normal probability plot. So choose it. Do a zoom nine. There's the normal probability plot, real quick and easy, matching what we did by hand. So from now on, you could just go straight to the calculator to do your normal probability plot and then just do a quick sketch of that on your paper. Now, here's the question. We made this plot to assess normality. What is it telling me? Is this data normal? Is it not normal? Uh, well, let's use our brains a little bit. Here's what we did. We took these values here, our proportional midpoints, and we put them through an inverse normal transformation. Inverse normal transformation to get our y values. Okay. Having taught this a few times, sometimes one student goes, has an aha moment at this point, but most students don't. They need a little bit more hand holding. So let me hold your hand a bit. Let's say I have a quadratic. Okay. I'll make a quick table of values here. Okay, so if you graph that, you get a curve, right? It's a quadratic, a parabola. Um, let's say I put this through an inverse transformation. What's the inverse of a square? A square root, right? So let's say I take the square root, square root of y over here. Now let's say I graph x versus the inverse of my quadratic. What kind of graph is that going to make? Okay. Try this again. Let's do a cubic. Okay, the inverse of a cubic is a cube root. So what if I take the cube root? And I graph x versus the cube root of y, or x versus, in other words, the inverse operation to what my function was going through. What kind of graph does that make? 
what if I did this, uh, let's say I had an exponential graph and I took uh, the log, what would happen? Right, because remember log is the inverse of an exponential. Okay, so what happens is it linearizes things, right? You can see that. So um, what we're saying is if this data were normal and I put my y-coordinates through this inverse normal transformation process, it should linearize the graph. So that's how you read it. Um, normal distributions uh, will create a linear shaped plot. That is pretty darn linear. So I would conclude that this data is normal or fairly normal. Okay. So now what would happen if I did this in um, inverse transformation on a non-normal distribution? Actually, before that, I, I purposefully saved Here's a data set from uh, a problem set we did earlier. You can see they're not in order, but let's, let's do a normal probability plot on those just to see what it would look like with a real world data set. Okay, so here's a normal probability plot for a real world data set. Um, I would read this as fairly linear. Is it perfectly linear? No, but it's pretty, pretty linear. So I would say that that data is uh, approximately normal. Now let's see what happens if I try this normal probability plot on something that's clearly non-normal. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the data set from this problem and let's add some values. Nine, 15, 29, uh, 30, 66, okay. And let's throw another one on there, how about 80? Hopefully you know what type of shape that that is without graphing it, but let, let's graph it just to, to show you. Do a histogram. Does that look normal? Not at all. It's not high in the middle, low on the ends, right? It's high on the left, low on the right. That is skewed right. Watch what happens when I do a normal probability plot for something that is skewed right. not even close to linear. See, it's very curved. So I took something that was right skewed, I did an inverse normal on it, and it became a curve, which makes sense because, you know, go back to my examples here, right? What if I had done uh, the cube root on this quadratic? Would these have become linear? No. What if I took the log of these? Would they be linear? No, right? So. Um, that's the point. There's, there's only one inverse operation on these, just like there's one inverse operation uh, for normal data, and that's the inverse normal operation. So that's how we read these. So I would, again, just sketch this curve on my paper and say this is non-linear, therefore the data is non-normal. It is right skewed. You can see that it's right skewed based on the spreading of these points, right? very clustered on the left and then very spread on the right. So um, this is right skewed. But the normal probability plot's not the best plot for reading skewness, right? That's why we have other graphs. Each graph has its own strength. The strength of this one is assessing normality, okay? All right, and there you go. So that ends uh, chapter two. We will be getting ready for our first test of the year shortly. So we're going to do a chapter one slash two test. Um, hopefully these videos were helpful. If you have questions, please come to office hours. Thanks and have a good day.